Good morning and welcome to this morning's session on knowledge transfer. So what do these things have in common? Drones, lifts, gloves, masks, road markings. Um, these are all this morning's examples who have benefited from and a diverse group who have benefited from the support from a diverse group of universities. So Northampton, Cranfield, University of Bedfordshire and the Open University. So there's an amazing cluster of institutions in the middle of the Oxford to Cambridge Arc. Um, I'm, by the way, director of the ARC Universities Group, it's nine universities from Oxford to Cambridge working together towards inclusive and sustainable economic growth for the Oxford to Cambridge ARC. So very pleased to, to be working with all these universities and, um, and a very warm welcome. Um, so we'll be talking about funding and support, what help is there, how to get it, and please keep the questions pouring in. Um, so if the speakers um, will, could stick to time, we'll have to race forward because, um, so it's good to see Silverstone's racetrack there in the background, um, as we've, we've um, had a few technical glitches and have lost some time. Um, and please use the chat bar or put your hand up because we'd like to make this as interactive as possible. Um, and if you want to, you can private message uh, using Zoom the individual speakers if you have questions to pick up with them individually. So first of all, um, University of Northampton, I'm going to hand over to Charlotte Patrick, who's the Knowledge Transfer Manager, um, and then we're going to hear a discussion with Matthias Itzitsky um, and uh, John Sinclair. So many thanks. <laughs> Right, good morning everybody. Uh, great to be the, the first speaker on today and also very pleased to be able to tell you uh, about knowledge transfer partnerships, which are a great mechanism uh, to involve a collaboration and innovation into your business. So the first part of the, our presentation today is, is to tell you a little bit more about uh, knowledge transfer partnerships. They've been running for over 45 years um, and they link your business to UK knowledge bases to deliver innovative projects led by inspired graduates. If you have an idea for your business but don't have all the in-house expertise needed to, to, deliver, to develop and deliver it, then uh, a knowledge transfer partnership may be the answer. Um, there's also a new variant of KTPs called management KTPs, which can also help you increase your business effectiveness by optimizing management systems and processes. It's a unique three-way partnership where you join forces with the university. The university employs a graduate who is then based in your company 100% of their time to develop the project further. So there's a number of reasons why companies uh, want to be involved in KTPs, and this is just a short list of some of the reasons. It's around embed embedding expertise, generating new knowledge, uh, driving competitive advantage, gaining privileged and cost-effective access to a university's resources. And the benefits for you is that it increases your revenue, it's your profits, you have access to new markets. One of the main reasons that companies want to take part is that it really helps you access resources that you don't have. It's part funded by Innovate UK, uh, and the costs vary uh, from around typically 75 to 90,000 pounds per year of a KTP project. And for a small to medium enterprise, it has a grant fund of 67 and for a larger corporate, 50%. Um, and the cost is comparable to employing a well-qualified well graduate, but it gives you so much more in terms of access to resources, access to uh, a dedicated team to deliver a strategic project, expert academic input to support the graduate and the project that you're looking to develop. Um, and the partnership also introduces uh, new capabilities and embeds knowledge in your business after the KTP. Knowledge transfer partnerships tend to last for anything from one to three years. Uh, at the University of Northampton, we tend to find that the best timing for ours is around 18 months to two years uh, to embed them into the company and to see some great lasting results. Uh, and I'm now gonna hand over to John Sinclair, who's the Dean of our Faculty of Arts, Science and Technology here at the University of Northampton, who will tell you more about some of our active knowledge transfer partnerships and give you a bit of a, a chat with one of our current active uh, KTP associates. Many thanks, Charlotte. Good morning, everybody. Yes, I'm John, John Sinclair. I'm the, the Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Science and Technology at the University of Northampton. Uh, and we have had a, a considerable degree of success in the past with KTPs. 
uh, which very much reflect our mission as a university that is uh, embedded in our local community and absolutely committed to uh, supporting local businesses and regional businesses. Uh, and some of the areas of expertise that I'd just like to pick up on very much reflect the history of the University of Northampton. Uh, so if you know us, then you wouldn't be at all surprised to see leather technology there at the top of the list. It's a unique aspect of the university's offer. Uh, it comes very much from the history of Northampton as being the uh, boot and shoe capital of England. Uh, and it's an area where we have had a number of recent KTPs. Uh, so my colleagues in leather, uh, for example, have worked with a company called Xeros, who uh, are actually a company with a background in the laundry industry, but became interested in the challenge of reducing water usage in uh, leather production. Uh, leather production uh, has uh, very much got a reputation as being a dirty industry, not, uh, not necessarily uh, a deserved reputation in the mod modern le leather industry, but that still hangs with it. It is certainly very water intensive. Uh, and so Xeros worked with uh, my colleagues to see if a technology that they had developed for laundries, which uses uh, specialist beads, uh, to reduce, very significantly reduce water usage could be applied to leather and that resulted in uh, several successful uh, patent developments. Uh, we've just started a new uh, KTP in leather in the last few months with the Scottish Leather Group, uh, which is focused on uh, using waste materials as part of the tanning process. So again, very much looking at the sustainability of the industry and improving the environmental performance of the industry. Uh, the example that's on screen uh, focuses around user-centered design. I have a very, very talented group of uh, design colleagues, particularly around product design. And they got involved uh, with a company called Lightpoint uh, two or three years back to look at um, techniques and technologies used in cancer surgery. And that has resulted in two brand new products, both of which I think are now on the market. The, the first it relates to laparoscopy, uh, so reducing the invasiveness of surgery for patients, uh, but also improving the feedback to the surgeon uh, from the device that they're using. And the second looks at the imaging of uh, cancer cells and allows for uh, immediate imaging of cell samples within the um, operating theater. So uh, greatly enhancing the surgeon's ability to be able to make critical decisions around supporting uh, the, the, the patient. I'm going to talk in a moment uh, to Mateusz, who's a, uh, one of our uh, graduates, uh, about the work that he's doing with a company in lift engineering. Uh, but we have a wide range of other areas where uh, we are um, very keen to continue our success in KTPs. Uh, in areas of, of healthcare, for example, around uh, cognitive impairment management, uh, around augmented and virtual reality applications, and I think we'll hear some more about some other work that other universities are doing in that area uh, in a little while. Uh, expertise in sustainable fashion, again with that sustainability theme. Non-destructive testing, which is a, a significant area of engineering expertise within my faculty, uh, and also uh, manufacturing, industrial design, and increasingly uh, digital solutions, for example, uh, around uh, the Internet of Things. But I thought it would be really useful if uh, we could have a, a little bit of a conversation this morning um, with people actually on the ground uh, heavily involved in knowledge transfer partnerships. So I'd like to welcome Mateusz. Good morning, Mateusz. Good morning, all. Hello. Hi. Hi. And Mateusz has just started working with a, a company called EES. Uh, on a KTP. Uh, we were hoping that uh, the chief executive of that company would be able to uh, join us this morning, but unfortunately that's not been possible. Uh, but Mateusz, I thought it might be very useful if we started uh, just by you uh, giving us a little bit of information about uh, yourself, please. Um, so I have uh, graduated from University of Northampton in 2019. Um, I studied mechanical engineering. It was a, a bachelor degree. 
uh, after uh, graduating, I worked in a laboratory, engineering laboratory of the same university. And then I was, uh, I've actually applied for the KTP and was lucky to uh, get the position. Uh, I, I was, yes. Sorry, you know, carry on, carry on. Yeah. Uh, so so in, in general, I really liked the uh, uh, research and development uh, career. In, in a sense. So that's why I was really interested in the KTP itself. Okay. Uh, was there anything specific to uh, EES uh, that attracted you to, to this position? Uh, so I've had some experience with EES uh, through a different project of ours. Uh, so we've uh, collaborated with them and uh, I really like the company and the way they operate and communicate with us. So that really uh, sort of took me in that direction, uh, but also the KTP itself, the project that we're working on uh, is in involving a lot of uh, areas which I wanted to get further knowledge on and uh, to develop further. So that's, that's really what took me there. Okay, thank you very, very much, Mateusz. So have uh, your new colleagues at EES, have, have they uh, given you any insight in terms of what they felt was the att attraction to having a knowledge transfer partnership? What, what's in it for them? Uh, so I think the main benefit and actually the reason why they uh, decided to use KTP as a solution was the R&D department, which is uh, rather small for the company, but uh, they had ambition of... Uh, develop a new product and uh, I think that's that's the best way because you, you have a lot of uh, brain power manpower as well uh, through uh, engaging KTP uh, for the relatively low cost and I think that's the, that's the main uh, benefit so the overall the company will uh, produce the, the solution the product which we're working on uh, in the long run they are they are going to be the one benefiting from from the project itself. Okay. Mateusz, there's just a question come in. What does EES do? Uh, so they are basically elevator engineering uh, solution services. Sorry. Uh, so at the moment, this is a mixture of uh, installing uh, parts of uh, engineer of of the lift industry as well as uh, producing fabricating some parts for them. And then the project which I'm working on is sort of kind of taking us slightly in a direction of fireproof solution as well. Uh, yeah, so that's basically. What, I, I am, what I am can you tell us, with, yes. Mateusz, without breaching uh, commercial confidentiality? Yeah, so so this, like, it, I, I can't tell too much, but in, in general, we are working on a fireproof solution for the lift in industry. Okay, so great. in the long run, there will be very good benefits. And that was really drawn me to the project because there's something that will benefit, uh, maybe not population, but some, some of the part of the population. So for the safety reasons. Mm, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Matej. Now, these are really challenging times to start a new job. So what have your first few months been like? What's your induction to the, the company been like? And in fact, have you actually been able to physically attend the company since you started? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, at, at the moment, only for the last three weeks, I work from home because that was a necessity. Uh, the beginning was, uh, so the company uh, is, is complying with all the regulations and all, all the safety of COVID. So there was, from my experience, it was very positive. I've, I've met all the colleagues and obviously we do have to uh, be careful what, what we're doing and how we're doing it. But overall, great experience. Okay, thank you. It's all right, Alistair. I think we're on time. So, um, Mateusz, from from your early experience, are there any uh, is there any advice that you would uh, give either a company that's interested in uh, becoming part of a KTP or to anyone out there who might be interested in becoming a KTP associate? What what are the lessons you've learned from the the early stages of of this project? Uh, so I think in, in overall for the company or the associate, uh, associate in themselves, uh, the bridge between the academia and uh, industry is, is just amazing because you, you, on one hand you are taught theory, but then you can actually experience and then uh, put it into practice with the industry. From the point of uh, companies, you, you can actually get new ideas, fresh ideas of, of academia and also the support from the academia for the associate is, is constant. 
so you can constantly work on, on development with Feather. Uh, from my experience, it's just amazing that you can start the KTP, you have certain budget for your personal development, and also uh, you're working on a project and the problems that are current and something that, you know, in the long run can be beneficial. So okay. like, I'll just definitely recommend to anyone interested, it's definitely worth it. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mateusz. Uh, and good luck with the rest of the project and good luck uh, onwards with your uh, ambitions in research and, and development too. Thank, you, uh, very much. thank you to you. Thank you to Charlotte uh, for uh, bailing me out this morning and, and giving me a relatively easy ride as part of this presentation. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Alistair, I think we're still within time and I can pass back to you to introduce the next set of speakers. Thanks very well much, done. everyone. Well done and thank you very much. Appreciate that, John. And, and thanks, Matthias. Good luck with everything. Um, and please keep the questions rolling in. Um, the uh, so so next we're just going down the road to Cranfield and Rob Rose, who's going to be joined by Edward Anastasikos Anastasikos, um, who's got some great, uh, very exciting things to tell us about the drone in the box, Hero Tech Eight. Okay, uh, morning everyone. Um, I'm Rob Rose. I'm head of business innovation at Cranfield University, and just very quickly to set the context from Cranfield's perspective. Um, so for those who probably haven't haven't previously engaged with Cranfield, you know, we attend kind of not an official line, but tend to joke. So we either do some things great and excellent or we don't do them at all. And one of the things we are really good at is, is basically um, doing postgraduate education in technology and management and uh, doing research. And that's been widely recognized. I mean, we have a, we have a, I mean, this is obviously not an exclusive list here. I could probably go on the whole day. We do, we do work with various sized companies um, on, um, on, 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 on various interesting things. I'm just kind of, yeah, waiting. Um, so um, just to kind of to say that um, one third of the income for us comes from an industry. Anita. Ah, here we go. So yeah, um, so as I said, you know, we do we do we do, do transformational research and 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 in, in terms of engineering, mechanical and um, you know aeronautical things, we are we are in the world top top 40. Uh, we're also number one in the UK for research income from industry per academic, and it's just one of the indicators how seriously we take work with an industry. And one of the things, sorry, <laughs> so what are our distinctive strengths? So distinctive strengths, um, we, we, we do operate on something along the lines of uh, research themes um, for, for, for those who obviously know the area and, and may have heard about Cranfield Airport. So um, aerospace is, is a very important uh, part of our portfolio. We own the airport. It is an active airport and it is it is actually a global research airport. So it's not just that it's operational, but we also can, uh, you know, actively do research for and on behalf of the industry or um, as well, indeed, um, you know, um, generally saying, so we also have defense security, we have energy and power, environmental and agri-food, um, management, manufacturing, transport systems, water research, and, um, I think today what I'd like probably to focus on is specifically what is an environment um, around aerospace. Great, excellent. This is this is a virtual snapshot actually of Cranfield, and 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 I think one of the things I just thought to say here is that we strongly believe in place, in 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 kind of in innovation space, in availability of infrastructure for businesses to engage with us and innovate, and it, this is just one snapshot of all the various things you know we have invested over the years um, in, in in aerospace and 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 as I did mention in the beginning you know we do believe in strong links with an industry so all of those interconnected parts are available as part of the ecosystem for businesses to engage um, and it starts from digital aviation um, you know finishing with various road-based uh, intelligence solutions and essentially um, 
this is continuing to grow. So we, we have a partnership with Barclays Eagle Lab um, and it's marked here on the map as Cranfield Eagle Lab and it's growing. So we have a new development coming up um, in the first quarter of this year, which is uh, which which hopefully touches the wood with everything else happening around the world will, will, will happen. Um, and it's going to be brand new facilities for businesses to grow um, as part of the Research England funded University Enterprise Zone project, uh, which will give more availability for companies to prototype. And I think at this stage, apologies for a bit disrupted presentation, I will probably pass on to Edward because I think Wards um, can say one thing, but you know, practical examples of how businesses actually engage with all those uh, parts of our aerospace ecosystem would uh, would say much more. Thanks, um, Edward. Hello. Do you want to go on unmute? Sure. Hi. Thanks. Uh, so my name is uh, Edward Anastaskis. I'm the CEO of Herotech 8. Um, we are a robotics company, uh, but I'll be discussing a little bit about what Herotech 8 uh, is, uh, what we do, and what, what it's meant uh, for us to partner closely with the university uh, in order to develop and deliver uh, our products and services. Great. So here at Tech 8, we're a robotics company and we are based at Cranfield uh, University's Eagle Labs. It's, uh, it's part of that Barclays uh, chain of incubators. Um, now we're based in Cranfield, but we also have uh, offices overseas in the US, um, uh, in California. Uh, and what we have at Barclays Eagle Labs or Cranfield Eagle Labs here, uh, it really provides us with a, a means to conduct a lot of our R&D. We have workshops, we have heavy machinery, uh, more than just you know 3D printers, uh, we almost have industry grade uh, machinery in. So we're, we're very comfortable in our setup here. And we were founded in about 2016, but it wasn't really until 2018 uh, where we sort of knew what we were doing. Uh, now we've grown, we have about 10 employees uh, of which some are uh, KTPs. Um, and with investment secured now uh, with key customers, we, we sort of believe that we are in this growth stage. Uh, and that we are sort of in the process of, of growing and scaling. Now, a little bit about our technology. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to share a video, um, a video here, but I'll drop it into the chat afterwards. Um, so here at Tech8, we build a robotic infrastructure or drone in a box technology, let's say, um, <clears throat> with the aim of removing the need for on-site pilots. Uh, today, in the current sort of regulatory environment, uh, you need a pilot whenever you are flying a drone. That's why you always see people with sort of uh, remote controls in their hands when they're flying. Uh, and they also needed to do lots of lots of other things like maintain the aircraft, uh, watch the aircraft, uh, recharge batteries and, and so on. And our goal is to simply remove the need for this. Uh, now our drone in a box technology is specifically designed to do this. It's conceptually very easy, uh, very simple. We take a third party drone and we make it a resident of this box that you see on the left here. Um, and this box contains the charging equipment, uh, the guidance systems, uh, which is what we've developed uh, at Cranfield, uh, our diagnostic systems, and on the right, you see our communications module. Now, our goal is really to make this as connected as possible and as automated as possible. So our goal is really to enable industry to take this box, to put it anywhere in the world with an internet connection and allow someone on the other side of the world to take control of it. Um, our core technology really effectively boils down to this picture. Oh, I just skipped a slide accidentally. Right, so our, the last point that I'd like to make about the technology that we are building uh, is we are delivering a service around this sort of infrastructure that we are distributing we are networking these boxes up together uh, and we're spreading them across a geographical area, say London, or in the real world case, uh, Reading, uh, Reading and in Kuala Lumpur. Now any authorized customer within this geographical area, uh, let's say either a farmer, uh, sewage treatment plant or a construction worker, they can log on to our browser uh, when, when they need it. Uh, they can request an aerial inspection and then sort of go about their day. Uh, that's it. A drone will magically appear from our box, uh, 
conduct this inspection automatically uh, and then upload all the data that it has captured into the cloud for processing uh, and for the use by that end customer. It's very, very simple. Uh, it's very scalable. Uh, it's very low cost. Um, and importantly, it's very on demand. So you get it when you need it. So now a little bit about the university relationship that we have. Um, Heritech 8 have a very, very close relationship with Cranfield. So I myself, I'm, I'm also Cranfield alumni from 2014, um, but Cranfield actually was really our first investor. Uh, we're not a spin out. Uh, we actually own all of our IP and we don't have uh, sort of a traditional 10 to 20% uh, ownership by, by the university. But Cranfield does own some shares in the company. And we did this at the beginning, uh, really because while we were very poor, uh, we needed uh, support in developing our intellectual property. Uh, Cranfield is a perfect place to do this, to build, test, prototype, and generate intellectual property. And we continue this tradition today. We have uh, lots of different uh, innovation projects with Cranfield across a, a number of Innovate UK, uh, uh, sorry, in, uh, across a lot of Innovate UK projects. So a little bit about uh, how we do this. Uh, so we are not a big company. Uh, we're a very small, or small organization. Uh, so when we do bring interns or students into the company, we really do expect them to embed themselves uh, into the company, our operations, our workflow. It's very different to what a student would get if they were to embed themselves in a large company. Um, now our strategy is to really propose very exciting, very impactful R&D projects to MSc engineering students with an objective to convert successful projects uh, into products or part of products really within 12 months. There, there isn't enough time uh, for us to consider really the, the very distant future. That's, that's not how, that's not in the sort of ethos of, the, of a startup. Um, to do this, we work very, very closely with the departments. In our case, it's the uh, autonomous vehicle design and control uh, course, as well as the AVD course as well. Uh, on top of this, we, we really do fully take advantage of the KTPs that we, we, we sponsor. We will take really excellent postgrads. We will part sponsor them. And then more than likely, we will hire them uh, because the cost of losing uh, trained personnel, I guess, and very, personnel that are very familiar with the technology that we are building, the cost of losing them is, is really, it's too great to bear for us. Now on the flip side, uh, we have a very similar relationship uh, with the School of Management. Um, as an engineer by background, we, we sometimes find it difficult to look at market research and frame business cases in a way that may be particularly meaningful to investors in the industry. Um, things like marketing can also be quite difficult to figure out. And this is where the School of Management uh, have been great because we can get a different pool of individuals, different uh, key skills um, with experience and enthusiasm to help us out in these, in, in these sort of areas. Um, so just a little bit about our future plans. Uh, we really believe that our base will remain at Cranfield uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, in many ways, we look at Cranfield as a base, not just for R&D, but really as a resource pool, uh, hiring great MSCs uh, and PhDs uh, in the field we specialize in, but also taking business know-how uh, to bring our products to market. Now, I mentioned that we have, a, have an office uh, in Berkeley, uh, and it's, it was originally a bit of a funding outpost for investment. What we found was that US, US universities, uh, American universities have a very, very key ambition to generate hugely impactful startups. Uh, the universities often have their own funds, um, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, invested across lots of different startups. It's, it's a very different world when you go over there. Um, and we are also funded by, by Berkeley, uh, Berkeley Startup Fund. Uh, these universities really push for these startups to grow Next to them, they you know they ask these startups to hire from them, uh, and so on. And we've seen this partnership arrangement really work very, very well. Uh, and that's sort of what we are trying to mimic here. Uh, we've been inspired by them, and we're trying to replicate this here with Cranfield as well. Uh, and I think that is it. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thanks very much, Edward. And you've you've um you've come in. In, inside the 15 minutes, just um, so with the precision of a, an automated drone um, and fascinating um, company. I'm really interested in this, the, what we can learn from America and those universities and that, that kind of relationship. Um, 
Okay, so so we're going to move on now. And next up, we have Gordon Brady from the University of Bedfordshire, um, and going to be talking to Simon Parker and Aldona from uh, Grovewood Ventures. Thank you. Morning, everybody. How are we doing? Um, hopefully, you're going to be talking back to us in the chat because you know me talking and being ignored. I'm I'm used to that at home with my wife, so I'm hoping you people are going to be different. Um, I'm going to whiz through, there's some slides on the screen, I'm going to leave them on the screen for kind of 10-15 seconds each and move to the next one. I'm sure you can all read so you don't need me to read them for you. Uh, I'm just looking for my buttons to move to the next slide now. Ah, things are moving. Fine. Uh, it's all good. Right, so I'm talking about universities rather than us as a university because we're we're a collaborative university and, and we work as part of the ARC Universities group. So that is Northampton, it's the Open University, it's Cranfield, it's all of us. Everyone has their own specialities. Some of us, you know, the, the things that you need will be at all of the universities and some of the things you need will be at one in particular. What we're focusing on is where do you as a business need to look longer term so that you're not just trying to react to the latest craze or the latest thing and then suddenly that dries up again. Um, and also what's your way in? What's your first and easiest way to start with university? Things like KTPs, they're great. I mean, they really are great. But it's a bit like saying, you know, I, I've met somebody in a bar, let's get married and have babies and travel the world together. Well, maybe you want to get to know each other a little bit first. So I want to give you some ideas on how you can get started doing that sort of thing. Still looking for my buttons, but in the meantime, things move along. So why do universities do it? We do this sort of stuff because, frankly, it generates income for us, it generates publications, it informs our teaching, it's all that sort of stuff. But also it generates tax income for the government because you're creating new jobs, you're creating new products, new processes, new services. Everything starts with a problem. That's what we're all about, trying to solve a problem that's out there. And the problems that we look at, not just our university, but across most universities, we're not looking at the latest, greatest, you know, what's this week's flavor of problem. There's no, there's no long-term value because otherwise you end up saying, oh, I'm researching Facebook this week. Oh, next week it's Snapchat. The week after it's TikTok. Things have moved on, things have moved on. So we're looking at the underlying problems and focusing everything we do around that. The reason for that is because these aren't going away. We will be looking at sustainability solutions for the next 20, 30 years. We'll be looking at healthy aging for the next 20, 30 years. These are UK level, European level, global problems. And if your business is focused on those same long-term objectives, you don't just suddenly run out of, where is it we're gonna work on next? What are we gonna do next? So for instance, looking at a big problem, yeah, okay, sustainability is a big thing. Yes, we've set up this wonderful, amazing renewable energy center. And it, you know, that's a big thing with TWI Limited in Cambridge. Um, it's been quite successful. We've set it up last year. We've brought in a few million pounds already for works that we're doing there. We do all sorts of other different things. Again, if they're not particularly relevant to you, then I don't want to waste your time looking at them. I'll just give you a bit of background on those there that you can read. But this is what I wanted to talk about really is the, the, the pathway. Where do you get started? If you want to go and work with Cranfield or Northampton or with us or with whoever, not quite sure how to go about it, not quite sure where to start. So we've put together some projects that are aimed at solving some of the short-term problems you might have as a business or giving you a route into things. We've got something for startups, something for innovators, something that says, I just need to be a bit more efficient as a business, something that gives you graduate skills into your business, all sorts of stuff. Uh, I think I've just clicked on the wrong button there. So hopefully that's gonna move on the slide now. There we are. This is our flagship, our, our easiest level. And fundamentally, you just come to us and say, here's the problems I want to look at. We'll pay for an academic to work with you for two or three days of their time over a week, two weeks, a month, two months, whatever you need. Pulling apart the problem and trying to work out what are the real bits that need looking at? What do you already know how to do and maybe just need some advice? What are the bits where you need some funding? What are the bits where you need some real big, meaty, in-depth research and investigation? And how can we put a plan together to get you where you want to be? 
that's our Innovation Bridges project, um, and it's it's a very simple and straightforward project to do. So for most of the most of the companies that are on this particular call, I suspect that's the way forward. Well, we've got others. It, it, productivity is a big problem in this country. We we aren't a terrifically efficient nation yet, and we're trying desperately to solve that. And that's across the board. Government is interested, so we've. Put together a project productivity escalator we'll start by measuring how productive you are now and then we'll see what can we do to improve it and then we'll take a baseline measurement at the end and see what difference have we made easy as that it's all funded there's grants there's people to come in there's all sorts of ways of doing things for you some of those innovation bridges projects that we've done before you know the, the one on the left here uptime systems that was a ktp that we're doing with them it's around monitoring pumps in heavy industries and controlling them, um, massive pumps in undersea situations or 200 small pumps in a high rise building, all to do with remote monitoring of equipment really, but the same technology transfers into offshore windmills and all sorts of stuff like that. Something in particular on COVID that we did on the right hand side there, if you were in yesterday's session, you'll have heard Jenny Murray talking um, and she started with us on Innovation Bridges and ended up getting, you know, I, I think she said she's moved from effectively filling nine bottles of product a day to now filling 900,000 bottles of product a day. So it, we kind of know what we're doing, but we are always focused on what's the business need. It's always about what is the business need. It's not about what do we need as a university. We'll find ways to work with you or we'll find ways for others to work with you. Last week, for instance, a company came to us, they have a particular need for mango ripening. Not a thing that I can help with. I haven't got anyone in my university who does mango ripening, believe it or not. Turns out Rob Rose at Cranfield, yeah, they've got a fellow there, a professor, no less, almost a professor of mango ripening. So easy enough for us to hand over to him. Uh, and that was just a, a two minute call, two minute pass over, job done but it saves the company asking the same questions a dozen different times. We do things with capital investment, things with relocating companies to the region, all sorts of stuff like that. We work with SEMLEP, we work with all the universities. It's just an easy way of doing it. We do lots of CPD stuff. Um, again, Lean Six Sigma, Prince 2, that sort of stuff, whatever the company needs. Uh, and what I really wanted to do was skip on and talk to Simon from R45 um, because Simon has only recently kind of learned of this world and started to get involved with us. Hopefully you're on the call now, Simon. Can you hear us? Yep, I'm here, Gordon. Thank Marvelous. you. And have you got control of your screen now? Uh, I hope so. I can't see it. Ah, here we go. I think I can see I, it. I just, I just clicked on the middle of the screen and things moved on, so it was fine for me. <laughs> okay. Can we, I, it's changing and I, I'm not even doing it. There you go. Do you want to tell people about what, how you got started with us and what, what you do? Yeah, well, good morning, everyone. Um, and thanks, Gordon, for the intro. Um, my name's Simon Parker. I'm a director here at R45. Um, I am here with my co-director, Aldona, who's sat opposite me. She's going to wave now, I hope. And so that's Aldona. Um, before I start talking about the company, let me just sort of explain how we got to know each other, Gordon. It's, uh, I was based at the Bedford Eye Lab, uh, had an office there, and one day uh, you guys, I think, had a, had a desk in reception or something, and I was introduced to Time to Grow um, and sort of started speaking about Time to Grow, and it became clear there were various sort of schemes and offerings that we could potentially um, sort of benefit from. Um, and yeah, so we started looking at potentially having um, a graduate to come and do some work with us and then conversations followed and, and that's where the journey started. Um, initially, we were kind of looking to develop um, various different type of eco PPE items. Um, and we had a conversation with you, Gordon. I think the eco angle, I believe, was what kind of caught your attention. Is that right? Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah. Certainly the sustainability side of what you were trying to do and cutting the end carbon footprints of stuff. Initially, you gave us, you offered us sort of 20 hours research by an academic, um, a, guy, a, a guy called Professor um, Gerch Rundwana. And to be honest, 
I was a little bit skeptical. I thought, oh, what does this guy know? You know, he's got lots of letters after his name. <laughs> he, he reads yeah. books. What's he done in the real world? You know, he just studies and he's, he's, he's a clever bod. I was amazed. Um, to be fair, I was so, 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 so surprised. He's not only smart, he was savvy, and he was actually far more commercially minded than, than I expected. And the report he produced for us just was immense. And it's really put us on a very, very exciting journey. And um, I can't speak highly enough of Gurch. He actually, oh, let me change slides. Where's the controls done? Okay, I have no, Anita, can you change the slide for me, please? Right, thank you, thank you. Um, so initially, um, we were looking at various items of PPE, uh, predominantly masks at that time. This was, um, I think, during lockdown one. And uh, Raj, Professor Raj, uh, sorry, not Professor Raj, that's not true, Gurch. Um, Gurch um, told us about a concept he was working with called the Singh Tata mask, which is a culturally competent PPE solution. So there are a lot of issues um, for people that work on the front line in, in, in COVID times or in hospitals where they're heavily bearded, which is predominantly um, sort of Sikhs, Muslims and Jewish communities where who have heavy beards, if they need to have a, a fit test with an FFP3 mask, to put a mask over your face, over a beard, it's almost impossible to get that proper seal. So uh, Dr. Raj um, Pal Singh came up with a solution and it was a, a kind of, <laughs> how we started, it was with a, a, a resistance band, an exercise resistance band, which he tucks, as you can see on the pictures, he tucks under his chin, pulls it across, ties it over the top of his turban. And this creates like a second skin over his beard. And then the mask ultimately fits over the top and gets that airtight seal. And every time when they were testing, they did a fit test, 100% of the time it would pass. Whereas with a beard, over 90% of the time it was failing. So Gordon, you mentioned about problems. This was absolutely solving a problem. Um, so we were lucky enough to meet with, uh, with Raj, with Gurch, and it, it took a bit, <laughs> if I'm honest, it took a bit of time. They were, uh, especially Raj, not the easiest man to deal with, tough, tough cookie. Um, tough cookie, he's a surgeon at Manchester. He's a transplant surgeon, right? So yeah. Um, yeah, clever man, cleverer than me, that's for sure. Um, but, and possibly not the most commercially minded, to be honest. However, really knew his product, um, a little bit naive about maybe what he thought he could achieve with it. However, it, the solution it, it offers, it, it, this is something that could ultimately help the world. It's not just a UK thing, it's, it's potentially scalable across, across the world. So this kind of, Put us on a bit of a journey. We started looking for materials um, that might have an eco angle as well. And what we actually discovered was um, a material that's a hybrid polymer material. So it's an, it's an eco material, it's recyclable, um, chemical free, non toxic, hypoallergenic. It has a greater tensile strength than vinyl. Um, it's flexible, it's stretchy, but it can also be turned, it can be used for gloves. Anyway, we, we identified this, um, this eco-friendly material, recyclable, chemical-free, hypoallergenic, strength, flexibility, it's stretchy. We thought, blimey, this, this would be perfect for gloves. And the machinery that we could use to use this material for the tartar mask could also be used to make gloves. And, the, and another benefit is the cost. The cost is kind of half the price of vinyl. And everyone knows what's happened in the glove market, disposable single use gloves, of, the demand has gone off the scale. And it's a win-win situation with this material. We can, we can effectively produce the tartar mask, we can produce gloves that are much cheaper than what's available on the market today. And they're an eco glove. 
So we, we've created the brand Glove, and, and, and to be honest, most of our focus is, is with gloves at the moment because the demand is just crazy. We've got some really exciting things to tell you about in a few seconds as well. Um, but yeah, it's same machine, same material, two purposes. Market's massive, demand's never been greater. So it's, uh, it, we really feel this is gonna get on the map very, very quickly. I'm just got a, we've had a promo video made for the gloves and the gloves, um, this is a first edit, so it's not perfect, but it's, it's okay. It's, it's only a minute long, so hopefully, yeah, here we go. was the idea that you didn't just say okay I can get these gloves made in China and let's uh, ship them over here by, by the cargo load air freight load why, yeah. why well, decide because you well, decide we are doing that we are doing that we have customers already this is this is accelerated beyond anything we thought was possible but the ultimate goal as you know is to get production over here so we're starting with the part, oh, I'm going to come on to that in a minute. Let me, I'm getting excited. <laughs> I always get overexcited, right? Simon, you might be getting overexcited. Am I running out of time? But you have run out of time. You're kidding. I, I, yeah, it was at 16 minutes. Um, I wondered, can we bring some things back if you'd like to make two closing points quickly? Oh, and then if we've got time for chat at the end, we can bring back and talk about some more stuff. Okay. Well, enthusiasm is infectious, but the time is against us. Right, okay. Well, look, these guys that you can see on your screen, Burger King, McDonald's, are all trialing it now. Um, everyone you see there is has samples and is actually trialing it in store. They're all interested. McDonald's alone, 150,000 boxes a month of gloves they get through. It's potentially massive. Um, we need help to scale. Basically, we, we, we have the experience, we have the expertise, we know what we're doing, but we need help to scale. R&D, capital, staffing, um, systems. We really, really, really need, need help to scale this. And we, you know, we will be looking for investment. We are hoping there's more money available and advice. You know? um, we have some key people on the team. Aldona has a huge business in Poland uh, that, that she owns and, um, not in this industry, but it's a business she scaled. So she's used to scaling businesses. Um, we have technical people and um, yeah, help. <laughs> well, we, we gave Simon right. a grant from the Innovation Bridges project to, to bring in a pilot. Um, he's made his own investment as well and production will be starting in the UK very shortly. Yeah. Very, very exciting story. Thanks very much. And I think it's one also that we featured in in the ARC University's newsletter as an, as an example, because I think in the pandemic, so many companies and universities getting together and solving problems together, and that was a perfect opportunity to take things forward. Um, thanks very much, um, guys. Uh, we're going to um, now go on to our final session um, for before, before discussion, and that's um, Gemma Mulder at The Open University um, with uh, Paul Aldridge from WJ South. Over to you. Thank you. Yeah, hi. So I'm Gemma Malda. I'm head of uh, uh, research and enterprise at the Open Uni, and I'm just going to whistle stop through what the uni Open University does. 
So many people think of the Open University as a distance learning provider, and they don't appreciate that we actually do have a campus. We have people. We have about 4,000 academics and support staff based in Milton Keynes. We're also home to about 300 PhD students and world-class labs there. We're the UK's largest university. We've got students all across the country. And alongside our teaching and research, we do things such as engage with the BBC for public engagement. And many of you may have seen our, our programme at the moment, Perfect Planet. So we've got a very broad range of academics who work here in Milton Keynes. Um, they're arranged into sort of four faculties and two um, research institutes. And STEM is by far our largest of the faculties. And our mission at the Open University is to be open to people, places, ideas and methods. And that mission really drives our academics. And they're really enthusiastic and they're really experienced at engaging with others in their research. They don't want to just publish and move on to the next thing. They want to work with others to, to achieve impact, to support growth in the regions, to help businesses and other organisations with their challenges and their, and their problems, and also to work in partnership with organisations to take their research in new and interesting directions. And we've got several methods by which we engage with businesses. KTPs, of, of the other um, colleagues have talked about a lot, knowledge transfer vouchers that I'll come back to. We offer internships where we've got internal funding that we can pay for at least two thirds of a student's salary. And obviously we can do virtual placements, which at the moment is very useful with uh, lockdown. And our students are very used to that remote ways of working. We can undertake joint collaborative research and seek external funding, or you can employ us directly to do contract research consultancy, to access our world-class facilities or to license our IP. So I just want to give you a couple of examples of activity that we're doing currently. If my slides move. So we've got um, a long-term partnership with a company called Teledyne E2V and they co-fund our Center for Electronic Imaging. And we're working with them on things like developing new high-speed imaging cameras. We're working with the Scotch Whiskey Research Institute and we're using the sniffing technology that we've designed for sampling meteorites to actually detect counterfeit whiskey, which is a massive threat to their um, industry. We've also got things like our stress map facility where organizations can undertake residual stress measurements. And we're working with the NHS blood services to develop virtual reality training methods for nurses. So knowledge transfer vouchers is one of our newer mechanisms that we relaunched last year to kickstart partnerships with industry. And we provide the funding to deliver short projects where businesses can work with us to help solve a problem. And it's that getting to know us and getting to see if bigger things are, are something you would want to work with us. We're continuing to run this, so please do get in touch if you think this could be of interest to you. And then just quickly, I want to run you through a couple of examples of our KTP. So you can see the breadth of our research and how we work with different organizations. So we worked with Hycrom, who are experts in chromatography. And we help work with them to provide new offers for their markets and expand their product delivery. We also work with the Book Trust to help them develop their digital open offering and opened up new revenue generating options for them. And now I'm going to pass you over to Paul Aldridge from WJ so he can talk about his experience of working with us. Hi everybody, so uh, my name is Paul Aldridge, I'm Sustainability Director for WJ Group um, and I'm going to talk about our KTP with WJ Products, which is one of our companies. So, I mean, it says here that it, the KTP allowed us to acquire and embed technical knowledge, expertise, R&D capability required to develop thermoplastic and cold, cold applied road marking products. It gave us sort of some technical competence that we didn't have, broadened our horizons, it gave us huge experience, it gave us the resource of the OU, access to equipment that as a smaller company, we just couldn't afford to access. And it also gave us access to sort of gifted scientific minds who quite remarkably from our point of view, actually sort of managed to speak the same language as we do. And that is this collaborative process is key to my mind as to how this works. So if I could have the next slide or I can move it along. Great. Lots of pictures. Whoops, back one. Yeah. So just let me tell you a little bit about what we do. We make road markings. And 
road markings are one of those things that everybody seems to, most people interact with most days of their life. The pandemic experience apart. So it's it's about, you know, guiding cars, making the, the travel network more efficient. But even if you get on a bus, you stop at a place that's marked out, it says bus stop. If you're a pedestrian, you go down, you, you walk across the road at a zebra crossing. All these things, people don't realise, and they, they appear magically overnight. They're also going to have a really interesting relationship with... Um, connected and autonomous vehicles. They presently need marking to know where they are on the road. So it, it, it's an industry which is sort of very analogue in a digital age. And what we were trying to do with our KTP was to develop more different, more and better ways of um, developing materials. So we turn over about 10 million pounds in products. We make 10,000 tonnes of material. To give you some idea of that, that 10,000 tonnes of material, when it's melted down into a road marking, is enough material to lay 20 million metres of line. We're 14 staff. We're, it's about 25% of the UK market. And we have a JV company in Belgium who we manufacture materials with. And that was working with them and helping to develop these uh, products. So one of the things we were looking at, whoops, didn't want the slide to move. Um, is it's, it's a very traditional industry. If you look at the black and white photograph in the middle, there's two men in the 50s pushing, pushing a, a, a pedestrian applicator down a road and it's hot material laid at 200 degrees centigrade. And remarkably, still in this 2021, a lot of markings are still laid in that, that manner. And we were looking for a cold material as opposed to a hot one because the idea was to sort of develop a more sustainable material. This material has to be heated to 200 degrees. And to give you some idea, that's about three quarters of a million litres of gas oil that we use to heat that material. So we worked with, we got to work with the Open University and looking at cold materials and different ways of curing. One of the problems with cold materials is they cure very slowly and we wanted to enhance this and we we're working with a methodology for doing this with light as, as a process for clip curing. This, um, this has worked and we're just developing that further and further. It, it's been a long process, but it's working with the OU, with our Belgian partners where we manufacture our cold materials and from there it's it, it's it's really grown another advantage that we found with having the ktp partners was it gave us credence in our market it's one of those things that we hadn't thought about but once again small companies trying to um, represent themselves to their, their clients. If you can have, you can talk competently about your own materials, but having the backing and the partnership with the university is really, really helpful in this whole uh, communications front. And it was a big advantage that we didn't realise, but it gave us great confidence for, in, with our clients and they're dealing with a professional organisation. Something else that needs to be emphasized so we've taken materials and we've moved them to trials if you there's a picture there are lots of stripes on the road that's a, a road trial site in belgium where we test them to european standards and get road trial certificates so that's a bit about how we worked with the with the open university to just develop new materials in a very very traditional market so I think that's that's about where I am. I can answer any questions anyone's got about this. This, but uh, there's that. That's the approach from our point of view. Thanks, Paul. Fantastic. Is there? Thanks, Paul. Is there anything that um, that you want to add, Gemma, or or um, should we go to? No, questions? that's everything. Thanks, Alistair. Fantastic. It was really interesting. The kind of trust, credibility, confidence. These are all kind of intangible things. I'm really interested in some of the, the chat that's come up. There's some interesting questions here um, about 
you know, how, what the relationship um, we've had, uh, Matthias and, and Edward, you came through your institution, so you knew your institution. Simon, you were talking about, you know, um, the, the responding to the irresistible courtship of Gordon Brady. Um, and and his team um, and I just just it, it's how do you start the relationship? This isn't simple buying. It's not like you know. Do you want um, okay? Here's your here's your your corner. Do you want a flake and some sprinkles on that? It's this is complex buying. So how do we get that relationship going? Um, and um, and it also seems that you that you've all shopped locally. Um, so so you've done worked with your nearest institution. Um, Simon, would you like to just say a little bit more about getting going? Sorry, Alistair, were you? Yeah, would you, would you like to say a little bit more about how you got going and what advice you would give to people thinking about it? Speak to Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> he's the man, I'm telling you, he's the man. <laughs> and uh, you can give me that fiver later, Gordon. <laughs> Thank you very much. I I am not the middleman. I'm more of a kind of signpost. So in the nicest possible way, um, there are very strong technical resources in uh, certain types of computing, for instance, at the Open University. So we've got projects that we partner with the Open University on. There's two or three different areas that Northampton really, really specialise in. Um, and so we partner with Northampton on various projects. And it, it because one university, it doesn't matter which one it is, one university won't do it all. Um, and, and so we partner with each other, we, we refer to, to each other, fine and fair enough. And then there are things that are bigger than all of us. There are, there are things that no university could do alone, uh, which is where Alistair's Arc Universities Group comes in. And that's, that's a real big making, making the region the place to innovate. Um, and I know Alistair's looking at all sorts of things, um, um, big agendas around sustainability and space and goodness knows what. If I, again, if I was looking at coming to the UK for the first time and thinking, where should I base myself? This really is the place that I would be right now. I think over the next 10 years, it's a no brainer. Sorry, I'll stop waffling. So Gemma, this, this, match between local i mean the open university has campuses on all in all four uk nations you have your reach is enormous this great utopian ideal of sharing with everyone it's it people i think might be surprised to hear that there's a campus and a location in melton Keynes. um so what what more is it that that the or how can the open university offer things that that others can't through that footprint I think I think we, the fact that we are endemic across the UK is, is a real asset of ours. So one of our KTPs currently is based up in um, in Scotland. You know, we're not limited by where we are. We can work with any organisation anywhere. And if you're a multi-based organisation, we can work across the piece with you. But we do have a lot of our academics, not a lot of our facilities are in Milton Keynes. So we do try and work with that local region as well. But it's also that we have students everywhere, which works particularly well for our interns. Although again, because we've perfected this method of virtual interns and, and the remote ways of working, we've got um, we've partnered students who are based in Cornwall, and I think they're working with a business in Yorkshire. You know, we're we're just not bound by our location. Fantastic. So so the, that that almost global network still still works. Uh, there was a particular question about a KT voucher. How do they work financially? What's the system? How do you cash it in? You are mute, Gemma. Thank you. Yeah, so we're putting about um, up to £10,000 per project in for these, and that's to cover things like our academic time, access to labs, travel, consumables. And we would expect the businesses to put sort of put in the in-kind contribution for their time, but it's any problem you've got, if we can help solve it, then we'll pay for our, our side of things, really. And it's just to get that initial, you know, it does take a lot of trust to work with a business. So you don't maybe want to invest your own money in trying if the university and the academics are the right people for you. So we sort of we'll put in our our money so that you can test the water with us and see if you do want to explore further relationships. Um, there was an interesting question, um, Richard Mel Melchick asking about 
how do you square academic versus industry priorities? Um, and, uh, you know, academics, some academics might be surprised at finding themselves working with industry. Um, Rob, you've got the, the Research and Innovation Office. How does Cranfield work, work that problem? Um, the, the, you know, what, what, what we are trying to do is to maximise opportunities across all of the strength of the Cranfield. And, and, and one of the things which I actually slightly skipped on my slides are the programmes, for example, which are done by our Bethany Centre of Entrepreneurship. Um, as being part, for example, of the national peer-to-peer -peer network delivery, uh, which is based on years of really successful business growth program, which helped countless businesses uh, kind of to unlock potential to grow. And, 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 and that is just one of kind of, you know, ways how we kind of basically increase pipeline and, 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 and have those opportunities identified, which are then crossing on to technical disciplines um you know and, and and you know we actively invest in things like for example uh we have a special program for our phd students called eye to eye which is all about discovering impact on uh business uh basically when they do perform or, or basically when they do perform uh, their phd research you know what does it mean in the wider wider world and again that's something which then helps to establish further relationships and and also, I thought just to mention is that we we do maintain as, as as part of the whole kind of ecosystem, we do maintain close relationship with uh, key stakeholders, like for example, venture capital companies. At least on one instance, um, I would say we've got referrals of the businesses who would fit with our technological strength, um, which then results on them actually kind of establishing their presence at Cranfield and getting more engaged in in a very complex range of activities, uh, you know, which can involve us, as Edward was already presenting, you know, a combination of KZP's Innovate UK proposals. Um, and I also mentioned in the chat, you know, is some of the things can be as simple as working, for example, on student and group projects. Great, I think Gordon's got something to add here. Do you want to come back in? Uh, it wasn't that I had particular things to add. I, I, I'm kind of curious to hear from some of the companies you know what what we've designed projects around the things that people tell us are the problem so you know i don't have time to do this r and I don't know where to start but i'm curious about are there other problems that we don't know about and that, you know, other other reasons why people haven't done this in the past or have they done it in the past and it's not gone well because the the world is very different in semlep in the last 5 years than it was previously I was just wondering whether anyone had anything to input on that. I'm, I'm not sure we can actually talk um, with participants, but um, certainly use the chat bar. Gordon, it seems that, that you should go on tour because um, people are asking for you in Huddersfield, um, Scotland. I think you could do a full UK tour here and, and also the transferability of credits across regions does it matter where you are from is this a regionally based thing or can it happen anywhere 95 percent of what we do is in the region because it, you need to build that that kind of regional ecosystem and strength but there's always that project that's from beyond the region and there's always a way of working with a company we did something with a company in manchester about uh, a year ago that we absolutely couldn't help with it was nothing that we, we had no strengths in it they didn't want to base themselves anywhere in the region that weren't economically active here but we did know or we found out who could help them and what sort of projects were available so it's still signposting and it they'll still come back to us in the future that company so it's make contact is the only way to start um, and i'm just the same if i need help with something i will come and ask everybody and and get whatever help they can, including asking Aldona where to visit when I was going to Warsaw recently. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. This, recipe, this restaurant's useful. Yeah, excellent. Well, you never um, told us, was it good, Gordon? It was great. <clears throat> it was great, okay. <laughs> um, just wanted to come back to something that Edward said just in the last few minutes about the states and how you, a university in, the, in America will get behind and invest and share IP and profit. What a, 
what are lessons that we can learn? When you see Oxford and Cambridge and they've got, you know, they're pouring out spin outs and they've got great machinery and investors, it doesn't, we don't seem to have the same richness in the middle. What can we learn, Edward? What would, should we be doing? Um, so I think the, I think in the US you have a very interesting advantage because there is, you have almost a network effect um, from the institution. So the University of California is, is sort of everywhere. Uh, and you have similar effects in, in, for example, Massachusetts with Boston, uh, you have Harvard, uh, MIT, um, and sort of all that whole area with, uh, with other universities like Princeton and, and so on. The, these hubs attract huge investment. Uh, so as you probably will know, Silicon Valley was sort of almost revolves around, um, around the universities that, that, uh, that spin up these startups. Um, we don't have that sort of machinery in the UK unless you are in, uh, in the sort of the big two, or perhaps if you are in London. Um, and it's, it's, it's very difficult as a result, perhaps if you are outside of these uh, sort of ecosystems, um, which is why things like the ARC are, are super important because it effectively allows a bridging uh, of investment to occur. Uh, that's really what we are looking forward to uh, because we do not have alumni from Oxford or Cambridge uh, or even London, um, but something to tap into uh, at Cranfield was the unique position within the aerospace sector. That's why we tapped into it. Um, it's very difficult just to say how we could do things differently if we do not have the resources to do it. Um, but I would say that bringing something that I saw very strongly over there was just how close the universities themselves were tied with the VC network over there. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't just one VC. It was thousands of VCs. I've seen VCs sit in lectures um, to, to almost do due diligence on, on either the startups that they are working with or the professors who are giving the, uh, the, the, the presentation. Um, they're doing due diligence on them because they have a startup as well, right? So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a startup machine out there. Um, it would be good to bring this relationship closer. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to suggest how to do this. But I know, for example, in Cranfield, you know, their relationships with, with Midven, MEIF, uh, those aren't the same. I mean, apologies to anybody from those companies attending this meeting, but those aren't those aren't the same kinds of engines, right? Those are a lot of a lot of that is, is government investment, and they're not. It's not maybe as nimble. Um, there, you have the the difference really is in the scale. It's the amount of money um, available and in circulation, but also a willingness to really take risks on some funky stuff. Um, so I think I think that's kind of it. It's you need that sort of network um, uh, of investors partnered up with sort of very exciting startups uh, coming out of the universities. Thank you for that. Sounds like a, a great to-do list and, and quite a challenging um, uh, set of things to, to achieve. Um, just wanted to say that if anyone on the call wanted to have direct contact with the universities and you haven't captured people's contact details, SEMLAP is your one-stop shop and it's also, SEMLAP is, is um, co-located at the, uh, the in, at Cranfield University. So there we are, um, a, a whole network within a network within a network. Um, many thanks for joining this morning. Look forward to welcoming you to further sessions. I've no idea what to do now. Um, so I suggest we all press our red buttons and, and leave and see you later. Thank you. Um, just, um, thank you, Alistair.